She then um, uh, was an early campaigner uh, for LGTB rights. Uh, she was involved in various campaigns, but joined um, the renowned Stonewall, where she was initially a senior policy officer. Uh, she rose over the years to become their director of public affairs. And I have to say, Ruth, you don't know this, but when I read that, I smiled because for nine years, I was also a public affairs director. It was for a different cause. It was for independent health and social care. But I understand what it is and how challenging it is and how round the clock it can be to carry the title um, of a director of public affairs. And there you went all the way up to becoming the deputy and then the acting and then indeed uh, the chief executive of Stonewall. And your journey through the, the, the Stonewall family, through the organization, was, um, I think, a remarkable time of change. You did a lot of outreach uh, in Wales and in Scotland. Um, uh, for example, you provide all kinds of services in the bilingual setting that increasingly Wales uh, is located within. Uh, but you also uh, were campaigning at a time of huge and positive legislative change. Um, it is an absolute delight that you're with us tonight. And I think it's very apposite. Who could have known, Ruth, when you chose the title for this lecture um, all those weeks ago? Um, so much has happened worldwide since. Building bridges amidst culture wars. Ruth, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Over to you. Tim, thank you very much for having me and thank you to all of you who have signed up to join the uh, lecture this evening. I know that you'll have a lot of pressures on your time and I think that when we booked this, of course, we, we, we wouldn't expect them to be in another lockdown. So for those of you who've got uh, small children around your ankles or distractions, distractions amongst you, uh, please, please don't worry about any of that. I'm just just thrilled you've been able to come along. Um, as Tim outlined uh, some of my history there, I'm going to talk to you today, probably for about uh, 45 minutes, about some of my thoughts around uh, this issue of culture, identity, how we're working as a world and how we're working as a society. Um, I'm used to very much talking in uh, public spaces. I'm finding the uh, talking in this kind of space, quite odd. I'm used to an audience and I, I like to have an audience. So I've, so with me today is my uh, characters of, I've got Jodie Whittaker um, and a Lego version of Jodie and Jodie sits on my, on my computer so I can pretend I've got an audience with me today because otherwise you feel a bit like you're speaking into a void. And one of the things I do enjoy is, a, is an audience. So forgive me if this sometimes feels a little bit overly transmitting and uh, I wish I could see your face and, and be in a room with you this evening. I'm going to talk a bit about myself first. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of keep it personal and individual and, and talk a little bit about my, my journey, giving some colour to some of the things that, uh, that Tim just outlined before I kind of step away from that and share my observations about how I think the way in which uh, we disagree and, this, and, and we, we work together is changing and is changing in, in quite an interesting way. And then I'm going to finish by talking about what I think some of the, the solutions to that, some of the things that we can do individually and together to counteract some of that sometimes quite frightening um, feeling of polarization and, and sense of isolation. I'm really aware that uh, the last year has had quite a profound impact on, I imagine most of our sense of self. I think my world has shrunk um, uh, I'm used to being out and about and around and suddenly my, my world is quite small and I think that that has both exacerbated and heightened uh, the sense of uh, d d division that can exist but of course it's also given us huge opportunities to realise how much we are united and how many how much we are we, we come together at moments of adversity our country does like a moment of adversity and if you'll forgive me, um, social media is, of course, um, a, a wonderful uh, thing in our in our world, but it is also a risk as well. So I'm, I'm going to talk quite personally today. And if you could avoid 
refresh referencing any of my very personal stuff on Twitter and social media. I, I'd really appreciate that, just because when my mum and dad see stuff out of context on Twitter, it's quite it's quite unsettling. So I'll I'll trust you, um, and I, I'm very happy to be open with you. But if you could if you could be careful about what you attribute on Twitter, it will immeasurably enhance the quality of my life. So as Tim says, I was I was born in Wales. I was born in 1980. Uh, my mum at that time was a midwife. My dad was a jobbing architect. He hadn't gone to university. The university didn't suit him at all. Um, he'd gone to join a little firm and had, had worked himself up as an apprentice. My mum had trained as a nurse at 21 and was training as a midwife and uh, did a PGC so she could teach midwifery. And throughout my childhood, she did uh, an MSc, then an MBA, then a PhD, and retired a couple of years ago as a professor of uh, women's health and, and midwifery at the University of Cardiff. So my, my childhood, if you like, me and my brother were both surrounded by parents who were absolutely determined to work extraordinarily hard in order to uh, have a different life to the, the life of poverty that their parents had had. My dad grew up in a small house in Barry with his dad was a docker and his mum didn't work much and they both died very young. Uh, my mum's mum and dad had five kids and a two up, two down and rarely enough money to pay the grocery bill. They wanted a different life. And therefore me and my brother were brought up to uh, always do our homework. I think we both had a desk and a chair from the age of two, lots of books. We had to do our homework before it was even set. There was never a chance of uh, having a day off school or skiving or anything like that. We, we had drilled into us that we had to work very, very hard. Uh, I was uh, brought up Christian. And although my mum and dad aren't, aren't a big fan of God anymore, they've kind of moved on. It, it stuck with me for, for reasons that I'll, I'll kind of explain. And I guess growing up, I always knew I was a little bit different. I, I was never quite like the other kids. I was quite sensitive, very bookish, really liked Lego and playing games and kind of keeping my head down. Uh, when I was 13, my mum's sister, uh, her, my aunt died in childbirth. She was 32 and her three small children, one who was, uh, Sean was four, Faye was two and Madeline was a baby. Uh, came and spent a lot more time with us as a family. But the other thing that was happening when I was 13 is I realized that I uh, fancied girls, not boys. And in 1993, that wasn't as an easier statement to make as it might be today. There certainly was no reference in uh, the media, really. Uh, most of the publicity around sexuality was about gay men and the assumption that gay men and HIV were a, a blight on society. There was a character in a, in a TV series called Brookside. I'm sure most of you are too young to know about Brookside, but there was a character called Beth Jordash, who was played by Anna Friel, who kissed a girl um, and blew my mind, but then, of course, uh, went on to kill her dad and bury him under the patio. So as, as, as role models go, it was, it was pretty rough. I went to Cardiff Library where they had a whole gay section and I used that word deliberately LGBTQI was not a thing then there was a gay section and I read two books The Well of Loneliness and Orange is Not the Only Fruit. Now my friends if, if you know any uh, little baby lesbians in your life who are wondering which books to read first The Well of Loneliness and Orange is Not the Only Fruit are not the two books to start on. The Well of Loneliness is a pretty dark tale and uh, Orange is Not the Only Fruit is marvellous and wonderful, but not, not when you're 13 and just want to know how to meet girls. So at 13, 14, I had a lot going on. And I think uh, it's, it's a difficult age being 13, 14. Grief was in my family. Uh, I, was, I was, uh, had a much closer relationship to the, the church that surrounded us during that time. Um, and I thought I fancied girls and I, and I wanted a girlfriend. So I managed to do my GCSEs and then at 16 my mum got a new job and we moved to Birmingham and the thing about Birmingham in 1998, uh, 96 actually, 96 to 98 compared to Cardiff is that Birmingham had a whole street of gay pubs and the other thing that happened in 1996 is I started writing for a magazine called Diva which is a magazine uh, aimed at uh, lesbians and I was getting a cheque for £400 a month for every article I wrote. And that £400 a month went into my instant saver Abbey National Bank account. And I had to spend it very quickly because my mum and dad couldn't know that I was getting all this cash. So it, 
being a, a young lesbian now in an all girls grammar school, uh, so surrounded by girls, way too much money um, and a strong emerging sense of my own self. I lived the life of Riley and uh, my mum and dad, who I talked to about my, my emerging sexuality at 13, 14, 15, at 16, it definitely became very much a real thing. 20 Marlboro lights, baggy jeans, number three haircut, leather jacket. I was definitely cock of the walk. And my mum and dad were very, very frightened. Uh, they were terrified about what would happen to me because not only was I, uh, was I thought I fancied girls, I was really gay um, and, and that was, that was a, a lot to handle. And they thought I would not get into university and I wouldn't get a job and it would be it would be an incredibly difficult time and their shame and anxiety and fear of course had an impact on my emerging sense of self and, and how that worked in government terms of course in 1997 tony blair had just been elected and i think that i understand better now than i did then quite how much that indicated a uh, sea change in terms of gay rights and again i use that term deliberately I think when I'd grown up under Thatcher and, and the HIV scandals and, of course, Section 28 was a product of the Thatcher government. And Se Section 28 was a piece of legislation that prevented the promotion of homosexuality in schools. So when I was a kid at school, we weren't even allowed to talk about gay stuff. Tony Blair came in and with him a promise of significant reform for lesbian and gay people and trans people as well. And by 2004, of course, we had the Civil Partnership Act and the first Gender Recognition Act. But between those times, 97, 98, uh, I went to, I managed to get into Oxford University. I went to uh, St. Hilda's College and became JCL president and became uh, OWSU president, president of the student union. And on both of those occasions, and of course, I'd been head girl of all my schools, what, what I was really aware of is that um, I, I might be gay, but I also was a leader, um, a campaigner, an advocate, and, and I had to find my voice in that space. And it was incredibly important that I found my voice in that space. But of course, Section 28 was still the thing. And I was the first uh, lesbian to be elected president of Oxford University Students' Union. It, it felt a big deal. And, and I think it was a big deal. Um, what came after that in, in early internet days, is that I had to think about my future career and the voice ringing in my ear was that nobody is going to employ you, Ruth. And so I got calls from the big five that I still don't know what they do, you know, all the Goldman Sachs's and the blah and the Arthur Anderson's and all this kind of stuff going, you're president of Oxford University Student Union, uh, we, we want you to come and work for us, Ruth. And I thought they won't want me. They won't, you know, they want they want something prettier and, and uh, longer hair and swishy haired and brooch wearing ears pierced loveliest nuss and that's not me and what I really wanted to do was to join the army because I did lots of online tests and all the online tests said you should go to Sandhurst and there's something about when you're feeling that the family you belong to is what I would call unsafe uncertain institutions are very compelling and and I really wanted to belong to a new family that was that was something like the military. There's also something great about a uniform when you're not quite keen on dresses and skirts that, that gives you permission to kind of have the look you want and short hair was definitely a plus. But the army had only changed the law about accepting LGB people into the military in around 1999. They'd been forced to do that by the European courts. So I didn't feel welcome there either. But what I was very clear that I wanted to try and make the world a better place and give my mum and dad the kind of materials and resources that they would have needed when they were a Welsh family living in Cardiff, trying to make sense of what their daughter was coming out with and what she was saying. So when a job came up at Stonewall, I took it. And at Stonewall at that stage was 25 staff, um, quite small really, really focused on parliamentary change. And Ian McKellen, so Ian McKellen, who's the founder of Stonewall, had gone to see John Major just before Tony Blair came in and given him a list of 10 legislative changes. And John Major promised that he would instigate all those changes. And when he lost the election and Tony Blair came in, 
Tony Blair made a similar commitment. So between 1997 and 2014, 2010 really, what you saw was a catalogue of legal changes, bash, jish, jish, gays in the military, adoption rights, uh, Human Fertility and Embryology Act, uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of legislation, the provision of goods and services, you can't discriminate against people on the grounds of goods and services. And my role was to change hearts and minds in Stonewall. And we started by doing research for the first time, we got YouGov to identify an LGB panel, we got um, more data driven, uh, lots of research into schools, lots of materials into schools. I started producing things like top 10 tips, how to tell your mum and dad you're gay, don't wait till you're drunk. Don't tell them in the middle of a row. Sit them down and talk to them calmly. You've had three years to get used to the idea. They've had three minutes. We just flooded the world with materials. We lobbied EastEnders, Hollyoaks, Coronation Street to include LGB characters. We kept pushing and we, we, we got together with institutions. So the Diversity Champions Programme was born and we persuaded different institutions. We identified the gay people in those institutions and persuaded them to very gently instigate new policies, practices and procedures that would just start moving the needle. So it feels in retrospect, particularly kind of uh, 2000 to 2010, a kind of wonderful era of uh, huge acceptance and, and very rapid change. And I think in, in my, my time there, at that stage in my career, I was thinking, this is great. We're banking change all the way through. We're just banking it. And none of those fights were easy ones. There was plenty of disagreement. You know, the Christian Institute um, would, would bring complaints and, and wrecking amendments and all sorts of things. None of it was straightforward, but it felt like we were banking success. And every time it was done, we banked success. But what I guess I realized when I became more senior in Stonewall and started looking around me a little bit more is that of course the campaign of gay rights and again I use that term quite deliberately the, ca the campaign of gay rights in kind of 2020 2000, 2010 uh, 2010 to 2020 was very much based on what I would describe as an assimilationist approach to gay rights, that we had to make sure we presented the very best face of gay in terms of legislative change, in terms of social change, in terms of policy change. We kept a very clean and neat idea about what gay people were. Gay people were white, uh, we were middle class, we wanted to get married and have children and pay our taxes, and we wanted to be just like straight people. And the idea was is that we would pose no threat to the fundamental systems and structures that exist in the world. We, we, the only thing that made us different from heterosexual people is that we were a same sex couple. And in that way, and using those conditions, we were, we were accepted into the mainstream. And I think history will judge whether that was, that was the right thing to do or not. But during that time, we rarely talked about bi people, bisexual people just didn't feature in Stonewall's narrative. At that time, Stonewall was not trans inclusive at all. We didn't cover trans issues. And personally, during that time, the feedback I got was, you need to grow your hair a little bit longer. You need to start wearing makeup. You need to be a little less gay. And this was from within the movement. You won't work well in parliament. You won't be taken seriously by politicians if you don't soften your image blouses instead of shirts, brooches instead of ties, accessorize, learn how to be a more presentable face of gay. So when I became uh, chief exec in, in 2014, I was already ready to bristle against that. I, I was, I was, it was chafing at me and it, and it felt wrong and it, and it didn't feel right that we were leaving people behind in this such successful social movement. And the kind of public example of that was that I, I did a significant campaign to bring trans people into Stonewall. And that included, um, a, 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 oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I, they all connect these days, don't they? Um, I've turned that off. Uh, my apologies, folks. I forget that these things are now all part of the same thing. Let me turn that off. 
so I, what was what was happening in those days is, is that what I wanted to do was was bring the trans people into Stonewall and that involved a lot of apologizing for what for what Stonewall had done to trans people in that time. I wanted to bring in uh, more people of color. I wanted us to start talking about bi people properly. I wanted to hear young voices. I, I wanted us to have a broader church, a broader table. I wanted us to build more bridges with different communities. But what also happened at that time is that uh, same sex marriage was introduced. And that was in fact, in a way, kind of a very significant point in, in gay rights. Theresa May came in and things changed a lot once Theresa May was asked to leave. We had the Brexit vote. We saw big changes happening across the way in which we talk about uh, all sorts of different issues. And the way in which gay rights was then positioned was that suddenly what we were asking for was a bit too much. And what we were demanding was a bit too much. So we developed a movement based very much on what I'd call affinity bias, that we were building relationships with each other, um, people like us, we were forming networks with people like us, and we were staying very much in our lane. We were following a very individual approach to equality rather than a collective approach to equality. And the problem is, is that at Stonewall, I tried to bring that in just at the moment, I think, when the nation and indeed the, the Northern Hemisphere certainly started rejecting that idea that we could widen the tent, broaden the table, redesign the table in order to accept people in. Because what also happened is that we'd also by 2014 had, had a significant length of time of Race Relations Amendment Act, Gender, uh, Sex, Sex Discrimination Act, all being replaced by the Equality Act. And the Equality Act kind of works on the assumption that uh, you kind of have to say, you put another chair around the table. So here we are, uh, we all have our position and we, we'd quite like someone black to be part of this group. So we're gonna put another chair around the table. But I think what different groups were saying and Black Lives Matter beautifully um, amplified this, but, but the messages weren't new, was that we don't want to be a guest around your table. We actually don't quite like your table. We think that the table could be redesigned. We think we could think about these things completely differently. So the expanding of Stonewall from an individual agenda, the expanding of different voices and different ways of thinking about these issues came at a time when, of course, as a country, we were becoming narrower in our ideas of, of community, narrower in our ideas of solidarity, narrower in our ideas of sticking together and supporting each other. So from a personal point of view, 2017, 18 and 19 was, I think, the one of the, probably the most trickiest period of my life. Because whilst we were trying to expand and look beyond our peripheral vision, enter stage left, of course, social media. And in 2015, social media was a thing, but it wasn't, it wasn't like this. And what happened when we started talking actively about trans inclusion is that the opposition to trans inclusion found a platform and a, often only a platform on social media. And so I was receiving up to 700 individual comments a day telling me that trans people didn't have the right to exist. And I, who's not trans, was absolutely doing my best to counter that. But Stonewall was neither equipped nor prepared for the battle to be taken to social media. I've sat in rooms up and down the country for hours and hours and hours talking to people who disagree on everything from gay adoption, same-sex marriage, the whole kaboot. Suddenly on Twitter, that was a very different frame for discussing things. And I share that not through a kind of um, uh, indulgent self-reflection, but I think what was happening there was a microcosm of what was happening on a huge number of other issues across the globe, manifested and epitomized, of course, by Trump. And what Trump did was popularize that way of combating each other, that way of disagreeing, that way of not relying on facts, that way of looking and seeking confirmation of our own biases through the articles we read and the people we follow. It narrowed our perspective. And if the, pro the president of the United States can narrow their perspective to that extent, the message that sent reeled around the world. 
And I think part of the current government struggle, and I'm a crossbencher in the House of Lords, so, so I, I, I'm not party political in any way, but part of the current government struggle is that it's very hard to think big policy long term when you are basically responding on a very short term basis to very, very narrow platforms. But nonetheless, we, we pursued at Stonewall and, and I was CEO until 2019 and, and saw remarkable changes, both in terms of race, disability and, and trans issues. The, the increased awareness around trans issues up and down the country, the increased knowledge and understanding and acceptance of trans people has, has definitely moved. People understand more about pronouns and non-binary and things like that. But at the same time, that opposition has got crueler, um, more... Uh, targeted, it's mean, it's deliberately undermining, and at times it is it is unsafe. So how do you this preamble? And I and thank you for indulging me. Is is really to ask the question: How on earth do you build bridges in, in a world where the, we're moving away from an assimilationist individual um, response to our needs and our identities? against a backdrop of increased aggression and backlash against that widening of perspective. And just before, when I left Stonewall, I, I was then invited to join the House of Lords. And, and to be honest with you, folks, I, I'm a bit too young um, and a, a, to, to be in the House of Lords. I'm 40. And I think if it had come when I was 50, I'd, be, I'd feel more ready for it. But I'm, a, I'm an activist and a campaigner from a different time already. I, I, you know, Theresa May, thought I was great. Boris doesn't, you know, Liz Truss has just announced that she's doing away with um, any kind of initiative around protected characteristics because race and sexuality are just trendy issues that, that, that don't need that don't need addressing. You know, I, I belong to a different era in a way. And I also feel a bit too young. So for the first time in quite a long time, I have quite a significant sense of uh, imposter syndrome and, and worry about how I'm going to, to exist in this space at this time and I think well it will be all right we'll go back we, we, the, the world's go in circles politics go in circles Biden's just been elected you know he has he he him pronouns in his in his uh, Twitter he's just appointed a trans person as part of his health team you know we, we we will revert back I just need to sit back and wait is the temptation because it's easy to kind of think I'll sit back at that moment but of course we can't because we're engaged in this world and I have this position and I have this responsibility in the House of Lords and for want of a better phrase I've just got to I've got to I've got to brace myself and stand up and be a grown-up and get in there and, and do what I need to do but it feels more scary now than it might have done three years ago so how do we manage that space how do we navigate the kind of all these different tensions that exist in order to start building those bridges and when we when we talk about building bridges um, the assumption is we're talking about reaching out to people who are so diametrically opposed to us and trying to find consensus. And there is an, always an element of that. We should always be talking to our enemy and trying to find the way forward. But sometimes people are just going to disagree on fundamental policy issues. That, that's kind of how it goes. And sometimes people are just evil. We know from history that there was no building bridges uh, despite what Never Chamberlain tried with Hitler, there, there was no building bridges there. It required very definitive and, and determined action to say no and no more. The building bridges comes by building bridges between communities who are struggling to exist in this new world order. That is where building bridges comes in. And there is a really interesting um, uh, research, and, and I wish I could cite it now, and I'm sorry I don't have it to hand, but it, but it demonstrates that 25% of people need to be committed to a change in order to achieve a tipping point in change of culture, change of ways of working, change, change of doing things. And now in my role at Deeds and Words, I, I, I'm taking a slightly more back seat. I, I won't probably do many more talks like this. My, my time doing these front talks is probably coming to an end. And my work with organizations, and very complex government departments is about trying to get enough people to start looking beyond themselves to their neighbours so we can get to that 25% tipping point. So the aim is to get to a 25% tipping point. And what we have to understand is that means that we have to take less of an individual assimilationist approach to our own rights. It is not enough for me to say, I want more rights for me. I have to say, 
we want more rights for us. We want more space for us. And that means at Stonewall, opening the door and making sure people from black backgrounds, trans people had those platforms and that space and that money and that resource. That was me sharing my power. And really what this building bridges and its cultural wars comes down to is about recognizing our own power and our own agency and making a decision how to use that power. And arguably, people have far less power than they did. I think the prime minister is less powerful than he was um, as a figure. You know, Margaret Thatcher was a powerful figure. Tony Blair was a powerful figure. David Cameron was not a powerful figure. And, I, and that's not party political, something's changing about how we, how we see power in our individuals. The presidents of the United States, we're, um, we've all run out of television and, and me and my partner Caroline are re-watching The West Wing, which is like a centrist, um, beautiful hot water bottle of comfort and joy. You know, the, the president in The West Wing is a, is a revered figure. That is not the case anymore. We've all got less power, but we have individual power to it made quite a difference in different situations. And inclusion, diversity, culture change is all about recognizing power. And a really simple example of that is if me and Caroline are, um, are walking down the street and I'm dressed like this and, and she, she, she reads as gay too, we, we do spot ourselves. We're on the tube, for example, and we experience uh, homophobic abuse in that moment. We have zero power. We are utterly powerless. And what I need in that moment is for the guy sitting next to me to intervene. I need him to say, are you all right? Are you getting off at this stop? Let me walk with you. I need him to intervene with the person if he's able to. I need him to report it afterwards. So it's not me reporting it. I have zero power. And if that guy sitting next to me does nothing, I'm going to presume that he agrees with the person who's being homophobic towards me. But the next day when I'm on the tube and I see someone experiencing Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, I have the power then. I have the power to say, this is not acceptable. Can I get off the tube with you? I'm gonna report this by the way. Um, I want you to know that I don't agree with what he says and I'm going to do something about it because I have the power. And really when we talk about building bridges amidst these cultural wars, what we're talking about is the need to recognize our individual power in any given situation to lift up and to support the person next to us who in that moment, has less power than you. Because we have to understand it in terms of our respective and relative power. We're losing faith in the institutions that we used to have faith in. That's why arguably democracy is, is entering its, its, its final days. And that means that we all have to demonstrate different ways of caring for each other that we wouldn't necessarily need to be quite so focused on because we'd be able to rely on the center. So we have to think beyond ourselves and we have to recognize our power. What that means is what I would say is describe as moving into what I call a positive active space of engagement. So I'm not a fan of quadrant models, but, but for those of you who are, just, just uh, try and draw this in your head for me. If you imagine positive in North, negative in South, active in East and passive in West. A negative active space is one that is hostile, degrading, it's anti-Semitic, it's racist, it's homophobic, it's transphobic, it's, it's, it's where Twitter can get to. It's where um, any, any moment can, can slip into that. That's negative active. None of us want to be there. Negative passive is an environment that is uh, full of what, what's sometimes referred to as microaggressions. It's a toxic environment. You don't really like the person you're going to work with, but you know, you know what it's going to be like. It's predictable, but it's basically not a nice place to be. Positive passive is where I think most, certainly most higher education institutions can get comfortable. Public sector can get very comfortable here. It's the space that says, I don't care if you're blue, black, gay or straight, we treat everybody the same. That presumes we don't have to do anything active in order to change the story. That we can presume that we are all good people doing our best. Positive passive basically is the gift to the individual person concerned with their own rights and their own responsibilities and their own concerns. Positive passive gives us permission to read The Guardian and maybe read a book occasionally, but not do very much. Positive active is where we want to be. And positive active is where when we can, we are actively using our power to change the narrative, change a situation, change a circumstance. 
that we're using our responsibility to nudge something in a different way. We are engaging in what I would call a little big thing in order to move that needle forward. And we all have power at different moments in different times. We have power of individuals. We have power in small groups of people. Sometimes we have power in the whole of our university or our whole department. And sometimes we have power in the society in which we exist. And our ability to exercise that power to achieve that positive active outcome varies depending on how tired we are, how much resilience we've got and what's going on for us. So to give an example of the food bank where I volunteer, as an individual, I know it's really hard for them to find tinned meat products. They're two pounds per unit instead of one pound a unit for a vegetarian product. We can't get the product. So my individual action is when I go to the food bank, I stop in Iceland and I buy five Frey Bentos pies, I spend a tenner and I put them in the box. That's my individual positive, active little big thing. As a team, I get the volunteer teams in the food bank to start emailing all the local shops, asking them to donate those tins of meat because they're so expensive. From an organisational point of view, we start writing to Frey Bentos themselves, asking them to make big donations. But from a societal point of view, I want to end food poverty. And my position in the Lords means that I can probably do something about that. But not, I can't always be existing on that level of ending food poverty. Sometimes all I can do is buy a tin of a Frey Bentos pie. The point is, is that I'm doing something positive active in those spaces. And the same goes around trans rights for me. So as an individual, when I had no power at Stonewall, I could mentor someone trans and do some fundraising for a local trans organization. When I ran a team at Stonewall, I could bring in some training for my specific team. When I ran the organization, I could change the remit and fundamentally redeploy resources. And now I'm in the Lords, I will be able to eventually change the law about trans people. I will use my power and my influence to achieve those positive active messages. But it relies us to recognize our power and influence. It relies on us deciding to take positive active steps and it relies on us being uncertain. So the other big barrier to building these bridges in these cultural wars is that we all have to be so certain. We have to know the answers all the time. And it's very difficult for us to say, I don't know, I'm not sure. I've watched with deep sadness the degree of anti-Semitism that has, that has swept through parts of the left um, over the last few years. And I'm not sure what to do, but being uncertain is, seems to be impossible. And I can go and read, and I will go and read, and I will listen to those podcasts, and I will talk to Jewish people about how it feels and what I should do differently. Black Lives Matter. What is my role as a white woman in that space? How do I do that? How can I learn? How can I be uncertain in order to make a greater difference and contribution to that positive active space to eradicate racism? So part of this navigating this space, achieving that 25% tipping point is allowing ourselves to be uncertain, allowing ourselves to not quite know the answers, but being open to using our power and influence in any way we can to build those alliances between ourselves in order to achieve that 25% tipping point. And my friends, so what that finally requires is kindness and compassion and patience and tolerance. And I'm afraid a Christian moment from me, forgiveness. Because in order to keep building those bridges, we have to be able to keep working together. And that means looking beyond our peripheral vision and understanding where someone's coming from and helping them be better and understand how they can use their power. So when a friend of mine who's uh, a, he's a, a grown up, big, powerful doctor in a big NHS trust, uh, heterosexual guy, I'm the godmother of his kids. He texted me the other day and went, I don't understand what this pronoun business is about, Ruth. Um, do I need to put it on my badge? And uh, what should I do about that? And is this all just a fad? And I could have recoiled. I could have gone, I can't believe you've not read this, 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 and this. But I also had to recognize that for that man to start put his pronouns in his email footer would be far more powerful than me putting my pronouns in my email footer. So I have to take the time to work with him to make that happen. 
And that is what positive active is. My positive active act for the day was sitting down with Ed and going, this is why pronouns are important. Nobody's going to mistake your pronouns, Ed. That's why you're lucky. He got it. He put his pronouns in his email footer. Those moments, those actions mean we have to be forgiving when people get things wrong. So in summary, I think I would say that, and, and I've tried to kind of explore how the individualistic approach to campaigning, certainly between those years of 97 to 2010, in a way gained huge amounts, but I think did us a disservice because it didn't prepare us for the battles that we have now. It didn't teach us how to work together and look beyond ourselves. It didn't teach us how to understand the, the importance of assimilation but the cost of that assimilation and how we mitigate against it. It didn't teach us to find our voices and find our strengths in the community that we can build together. So what we need now is that active, positive steps for every single individual on this call to reach out to someone else and say, how can I lend you my power? And you have more power than other people by virtue of the fact you're on this call. Many of you have got ac.uk email addresses. You will know three people in your sphere who have less power and influence than you, who can borrow your power and influence. So find those three people and identify your little big thing to do something positive active. And then in turn, we can move into a space where we're achieving that 25% tipping point of culture change. And that's how you mitigate against the individualistic, fierce cruelty that is coming out in the culture wars now. I have high hopes for Biden. I think he will be part of that culture change of that tipping point as well. But we all have an individual part to play. So thank you. I'm so sorry that my phone rang through my computer. That is an Apple Mac wonder that I still don't quite understand. And I'm really, really happy to take questions, comments, disagreements, prevarication uh, in a constructive and warm way. Thank you very much, Tim. Ruth, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, it was insightful, it was powerful, it was brilliant. Um, and most importantly of all, it was done with such kindness and with such love. So thank you for that. Um, we have got some questions that have come in, which I will read. Um, but I would like to, I'd like to start, if I may, um, uh, with, with a question. You talked about um, the cruelty of, of the way that some social media has drifted in recent years. If we go back, um, uh, it was almost as if uh, Roosevelt, FDR, was um, the US president for radio. And then perhaps um, uh, JFK and Ronnie Reagan made television their thing. Um, um, Trump, of course, uh, has been the first president to really use Twitter. And as these technologies develop, not only did they become, they roll out much faster than previous technologies, but they are in a sense much more individualistic. We now live for the first time in a world of, of where each individual can be their own broadcaster almost. It, we live in a, a multi-million to million world channel. And my impression of, of this space now is it's rather like some of the sports that were developed, you know, in the in 19th century or earlier. It's rather like football, you know, have a football match on a local derby between I don't know Southampton and Portsmouth, but oh, don't have a referee, don't have any policing or any security. Oh, and then there's some heat, there's some fireworks, and oh, there's some fisticuffs. And then people want to blame the owner of the football stadium, you know, just as people at the moment want to blame some of the owners of the social media platforms. So it, I'd like to ask you, um, because you are now you carry the mantle of being a legislator. So, but, but you have the insights of a former public affairs director and a brilliant campaigner. So what sort of standards or, or refereeship, um, or dare I say it, legislation might have to be put in place um, so that um, the sport of dialogue and debate and open discourse carries on, but directly to your point about uh, making sure that democracy and circulating elites and open society is sustainable, that that, um, that the fisticuffs and the bad manners don't uh, take hold and that people remain civil. 
Thank you, Tim. And I, I think it's a really important uh, observation. And, and one of the things that I'm I'm most aware of uh, externally is, is I think one of the one of the most pos one of the most passive things that you can do in achieving culture is being a bystander. So it's when you you sit back and you watch it happen. You might you might as well be part of the problem. And the thing about social media is it makes bystanders of all of us. So when there's a pile on going on and, and, and you know, there, there have been times when I have had relentless kind of kicking um, and I see it every day. Every day someone's getting it. Nobody gets involved. You can't get involved because it, the, the risk of drawing that wrath down on yourself is high. You don't really want to get involved. You don't want to be part of the problem. You might send a private DM, um, but you, you kind of don't want to get into it. And that's the fundamental problem in that nobody is is kind of using collective leadership to say you're perfectly entitled to hold that view that's not the way we talk to each other here and until we find a way of um kind of collectively being able to say you're perfectly entitled with your view that's not how we talk to each other here without um a fear of favor so that is that is universally applied we won't sort of start um creating a culture of behavior in these new spaces now, when you're in, a, in, in an, an academic setting or when I'm in the House of Lords or anything like that, there are unwritten and written rules about how you behave. Schools work on that basis. They, they, we wouldn't be able to cope if there were no rules, um, social rules that govern how we relate to each other. Social media has emerged without any of those social rules. And of course, some of them are, have happened. So Instagram, for example, is, is has to be a very friendly space and we don't want it otherwise. Um, and so there's a kind of, um, well, that's just not what you do on Instagram, if anybody's mean. LinkedIn, you know, you can't be too emotional. Uh, that's not, so Twitter hasn't got its own social code about, about how we talk to each other. So legislation, I think, has a place. Um, regulation has a place, but, but actually it's never going to be the solution. Because in all the times I've, uh, things I've learned from Stonewall is that, is that legislation top, coming from the top doesn't achieve social change. Legislation is always a product of where society is at. If, if you're trying to achieve culture and social change, you could only do it if you've got that 25%. And what you have instead is people opting out. So, you know, just don't go on. Just so, so Twitter again becomes even more of a closed, folding in itself, angry mob um, that isn't actually achieving anything. So one of the big things that I learned, uh, we bought in a, a, a charity called Build Up and build up are a um, expert on social media, but also peacekeeping. And they work on um, brokering peace in the Sudan. Do you know what I mean? Kind of quite major things. And we brought them in on, on the trans stuff and they mapped all of our social media. And what it found was that there was a cluster of 700 people who were sending up to 10 to 20 tweets a day to targeted individuals. And in the middle was this whole group of people who did, had no idea what any of it was about. And over here was a group of people who supported. And what we realized is we had to get um, Twitter to about 25 percent and we in, in all our different areas. And that's what we did. And we but we had to learn to turn down the volume on that cluster of 700. And block is an act of aggression. Mute is mute is doable. Um, and what but we didn't get there fast enough and we didn't get there fast enough because we were too distracted by it. We, 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 we gave it too much credence. It took this company coming in and mapping it for us for us to go, oh, come on, why are we directing all our energy into this? But of course, the risk is, is that um, that that can be powerful if it if it links in with certain people. So Liz Trust is, is linked in with that and that 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 nest of 700. So how do we how do we manage that? Well, we just need the, the power over here. So we can get overly um, distracted by the perceived power of the mob, but our, our humanity and our psychology means that keeping the narrative in our head that this is this and not this is incredibly difficult. Because when someone tweets me and gets 100,000 likes going, you are scum, that will have a mark. And I think the, the other thing that's happening is that we're not acknowledging the impact. So the narrative is, well, it doesn't bother me, it's only social media, but of course it leaves a mark. And if, if we are unable to acknowledge that, we don't mitigate against it. So Stonewall had to go through some rapid learning in those in those couple of years, so certainly 2015 to 17. And we made huge numbers of mistakes in those time in how we managed that and how we countered that. 
Brilliant. Thank you for that. We have uh, quite a number of questions. Um, Ian has asked, how can we promote changes and updates to current legislation when the current government clearly wants to roll things back? And he'd also ask, you were born and raised in Wales. Um, were you aware of um, uh, LGSM? LGSM, yeah. And um, about when you were growing up? I have to throw in the Welsh angle with my own surname Evans. So yeah, well, you're you're a good good Welsh stock. LG, LGSM wasn't so for those of you and and Ian, we, you might I don't know how possible it is for you to come in. You probably know more about this than I do. I mean, I was LGSM wasn't part of my family's discourse. So although we did a lot on um, supporting the miners during the strikes and 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 all that, the gay the the, the lesbian and gay supporting the miners certainly didn't come into our household. I mean, it was it was not something that was talked about. Certainly not talked about in schools, and not reflected. And I and I and that that's a that's a, a, a source of sadness for me. And I I, I wonder sometimes if my mum and dad know about it now. Um, I, I need to show them the film but, Pride at some point. Ian has come in, and he's come in with a quote. What's the point of fighting for gay rights if you aren't fighting for workers' rights? Precisely. What's the point of fighting for workers' rights if you aren't fighting for women's rights? So it's that. Like and it. I and I think and that's exactly it. But something happened in '97 onwards where we lost that message. And I don't think I I mean I know about it from from the gay rights angle, but I think it happened in feminism. I think you know the Lean In agenda from from um, whatever her name is basically says look after yourself make sure you're you're okay and i mean we could get into it Ian, and probably that's a product of capitalism and, and all sorts of different things but there was something about uh collective action solidarity standing together that was eroded not by thatcher you know I, it's kind of like well the you know the tories eroded that and eroded the trade unions it's, it's not no it happened in 97 98 Maybe it was Blair taking out the trade union clause. I mean, may, maybe that's what, what had an impact. But of course, the trade unions were always very white male um, misogynists. So, so there's these kind of, it, it, it's a really, I'm not smart enough to do the PhD in it, but there is some, some work to be done there on the, the extent to which um, pursuing a legislative agenda that was about individual rights um, meant that we, we got to the end and transitioning um supporters from i want to get married to what are we doing about um lgbt rights in uganda for example was very difficult you know transitioning people from i to we was very difficult we trained a generation of activists who are concerned about i not we and we're paying the price now i think i think that's that's kind of what's going on there you mentioned there i mean you mentioned earlier about power and the loss of power by prime ministers. We are increasingly living in a world, probably by dint of communications and, and, and globalization, and the reality of differentiated polities and power structures. Mm. Um, the great globules of power that used to reside in palaces and prime ministers' offices the world over and ministries of state is in some ways being differentiated. Um, how do you think we as a country are doing on these issues uh, on the basis of a global comparator are we doing well are we a beacon uh, did we do well but we're losing and going back you know sliding back um, um, one would hope that we're a beacon uh, at Middlesex we try to be a beacon amongst beacons but how what are your reflections on the global state of play. I, I mean, I get very worried when I look at what's going on, rising authoritarianism, you know, in parts of the uh, parts of the world that are close to my heart, like Poland and Hungary, there are other parts of the world that have long struggled. But there are also lots of rays of height uh, of, of, of light and and, and 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 reasons to be cheerful. Mm. You'll have a much greater feel for this. I mean, in terms of um, the inclusion agenda, we are we are. Uh, We've dropped, we've dropped behind. And the reason why we've dropped behind is, is simply on a legislative grounds. So we used to be the best in the world and now we're not. Uh, there are countries who are ahead of us on, on trans issues. The second is about how we use our global influencing has changed. So, so what used to happen, and, and I used to do a lot of this uh, backstage, is that, is that ministers would go into countries and say that this is not my stump speech, but we're really not happy about how things are going. Um, and we got to a beautiful moment where conservative ministers were able to reflect on their own journey. 
So we had Conservative ministers going in going, look, we introduced Section 28. We introduced an unequal age of consent. We, we did a lot of these things. This is the journey we've been on as the right wing party. And these are the benefits we've yielded uh, from an economic point of view, a tourism point of view. You know, So this isn't all about rainbows and fluff. Do you know what I mean? They, they were able to anchor creating inclusive societies. Now, I, I am I do. A, a, I'm, I'm very much of the view that when when faith in institutions fall apart, that is that is uh, heightened by people feeling disenfranchised and that disenfranchisement comes from inequalities, whether that's economic inequalities, racism, uh, discrimination. And that is that is the breeding ground of terrorism. You know, if, if you do not if you do not feel part of the community in which you live, serve, socialize, play and pray, you seek to secure that power in a different way. And I think that the current governments and, that, and that, uh, the, absolutely the current administration doesn't understand that. They understand it in terms of um, uh, headline grabbing. So the, the current move of, you know, well, we should all have equal chance is absolutely the right one, but they can't simultaneously cut universal credit. So you, you can't you, you can kind of go right. You know, we want to we want to create a level playing field so everybody feels they belong. And that's not just about race, gender, disability. It's also about white working class, which it absolutely is. Um, and in, but if they believe that they would make social include um, social mobility part of the Equality Act. I mean, that's the way to do it. You know, what Middlesex has done is is followed absolutely with good intent what the Equality Act asked you to do. And, and you predicted it. And you're probably already doing it in relation to social mobility because universities do in relation to free school meals and access to higher education. Right. So so make it part of the Equality Act. And instead, what it's done is, is they it's used to point scores. So but what will change is Biden, because suddenly we need to trade with America. And Britain now has a global reputation of being incredibly transphobic. Um, and that is a. Uh, result of uh, lots and lots of different things, but but in part to do with uh, the mainstream media that very quickly learnt that if they wrote a transphobic article, they got lots of clicks. So the Times has written an article pretty much every day. I've had three front pages of the Sunday Times uh, saying that I've been fired, uh, that I've lost loads of money at Stonewall, like just absolutely defamation stuff that um, but I'm, you know, I ran a charity. <laughs> you know, I, I shouldn't have been the key target for the Sunday Times in its anti-trans agenda, but I absolutely was, and I was out of my depths when some of that stuff happened. So, so there's, and that's all about clicks, and it's all about um, appealing to a populist government. But trans are supported by uh, Carrie Simons, um, Boris's wife. You know, the, 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 these things don't don't stay stuck forever. But Britain is not in a good place, heightened by Brexit. We are a little nation who still thinks we have a navy um, that can can unite us with the world, and we haven't quite understood that that's not the case. Yeah, the connection is. Well, it's the essence of good governance and statecraft, isn't it? Right across the spectrum and the interconnectedness of all those items. Um, question from Catherine. Um, she's actually asked two. Um, the second one is very, very direct. I love it. What can we do about the anti-woke brigade? But the substantive point Catherine makes is, can you say a little bit about institutional homophobia? When no one individual or group is overtly homophobic, but collectively uh, LGBTQ plus concerns are omitted. Um, I think yeah. you can probably read it on your screen. You can see that question. Yeah. Um, and it, it, yeah, it, it's, it's small pieces of research done, for example, by the charity at the moment with COVID, but you know, um, you you get the point. What what can be done there? And the and, that one. And, and this this is this is, this question about uh, the structures and systems that perpetuate inequalities is is the nub of the issue, um, not just in relation to homophobia and transphobia, but but very much in relation to racism um, as well. In that people respond because of this individual approach we've taken to equalities, and and because of the the heightened nature of individualism that comes through our politics and our social media, we think about what I can do and what we can do. And so if we say this organisation is, is institutionally homophobic, the answer is I'm not homophobic. Um, rather than how are our systems, policies, practices and procedures perpetuating inequalities. And in terms of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, 
the the assumptions of um, so much research is is based on heterosexuality that we're just continually missing tricks. Mm. So even even when I was was a uh, as a little baby researcher at, at Stonewall, trying to get um, ways of recording sexual orientation on your health records as part of the issues that are impact on your health outcomes, not as an indication of mental illness is incredibly important. So if we knew, if I was able to put on my records that, that I'm, I'm gay, then you can start doing trends of analysis then. You can start seeing how many LGBT people are taking illegal drugs compared to heterosexual people. Then you can target resources in a different way. You know, it's, it's really simple. It's really, it's not, it's not rocket science stuff, but there's a real reluctance to do any kind of systemic and meaningful data collection that enables us to develop evidence bases that enables us to change policies. Now, I'd love to think that was just about LGBT, but what we've seen in COVID is that is exactly why we've had a disproportionate number of black and ethnic minority and Asian deaths, because of, as, as, a, as a country, our inability to differentiate between differential experiences within our communities. So what we've seen with COVID is that black people are dying faster and more regularly. Why is that? And when that, when that research came, when that figure came out, the kind of nation went, well, it's because of the genes and vitamin D. Uh, what the alternative um, uh, uh, SAGE group, which is an excellent resource, actually, the alternative SAGE group found is, no, it's because uh, people of colour are in lower paid roles, are less likely to be able to ask for PPE, are more likely to be living in cramped conditions, are less likely to be able to take time off um, and go without pay. These are structural and systemic incidences of racism that means that more black people are dying. And, and I think there is a very real reluctance to engage with some of these subjects on that systemic basis. Um, and that, that gets in the way of making any meaningful change and keeps us stuck in this conversation of am I biased, aren't I biased? And we are all biased. We all have biases. I grew up in a white little town with white parents um, where, you know, th there were no black people at all. Of and I have benefited hugely from being white. I would not have got away with being a lesbian like me and being accepted to the house was if I'd also been black. I mean, I think it would have you know, I get I get away with more stuff because I'm white, but we are unable to engage with those subjects in any kind of meaningful way. And the Equality Act hasn't man made it happen. So there is something about the work I do at Deeds and Words, the work we do is, is very much about how do we shift that culture so people recognise that when they're designing that survey, when they're designing that system, that recruitment policy, that way of working, they are thinking across the piece about these different voices and ways of seeing. Um, I'm part of a group that is that where I'm the only woman um, and I made this observation to the leader of that group and what he did was um, find a secretary and he said here's, here's the woman and I met her at party and she's lovely and she's now our administrator and it's because he doesn't see that that group is less effective because there are fewer perspectives in that room yes he, he, he doesn't understand that he would get a wider lens if he had more women in that room. He thinks it's about the optics and he thinks it's because I'm lonely and he thinks it can be addressed by just hiring a woman to do the admin. And that is prevalent across a significant numbers of sectors and areas that people don't fully understand that the point of diversity is not about a Benetton advert, yep. it's about creating a different way of seeing. Sorry, I'm giving very long answers. To no, uh, no, that's absolutely brilliant. And um, uh, I'm supposed to be a neutral chair and neutral academic, but I <laughs> profoundly what you just said, but that will be no surprise to you. So next question is from uh, Anthony. Uh, he says, thanks so much for doing this evening, Ruth. I wanted to ask, what do you feel is your greatest achievement in furthering LGTB? And I think then he has a reflective element. Do you have any regrets? You know, are there things you've learned or would do differently? Um, yeah. I know Anthony, uh, and, and I know he's a, an excellent academic who is very much there to help people reflect and, and to think about these things. So it's, it's a natural question. Oh, of course. Well, well, but well, my reflections on things I could have done differently are, are lengthy, continuous and um, ongoing. Um, but I'll, I'll try and summarise them now. I mean, I, I think certainly 
um, Deeds and Words works entirely on reflective practice. That's that's the origin of all our leadership programs is reflective practice. So, so this notion of, of, of thinking about what we could have done differently is, is very important. I think that um, the thing I'm, I'm most proud of in terms of Stonewall, I think, was um, that 14 years of commitment was an important one for me personally to right a lot of wrongs. And I think I practically did a lot of that. But I also think that, that the move to um, getting to a place where 700 companies, public sector and private sector, are actively talking about LGBT inclusion and what they can do to advance it is the single most effective campaign I've ever engaged in. And the reason why it's the single most effective campaign I've ever engaged in is because the players don't even know they're part of a campaign. So when Barclays get very, very annoyed that Pinsent Masons is doing better than them because yep. they've introduced non-binary facilities and understood uh, the complex nature of gender neutral facilities and Barclays needs to up its game on that. That's a beautiful outcome. So um, there's lots of stuff, but I think that that uh, mobilizing non-traditional players to achieve change was quite important. In terms of things I, I wish I'd done differently, I, I wish I'd understood more about collective and shared leadership at the beginning of my tenure as CEO, because I think I would have um, achieved more by, by avoiding the seduction of a heroic leadership model that Stonewall demanded. And I think it put too much pressure on me as an individual and on the brand in a way that I could have mitigated through a, a slightly more sophisticated approach to thinking about leadership. I also regret that I have yet to establish and develop a sufficiently robust um, way of separating out the wheat from the chaff in some of the some of the stuff that comes. I think I think I'm. It, it, it's a problem that persists to this day that, that I can still very much engage with content that doesn't doesn't need my attention. Um, and I, I should get better at kind of being confident in my own ability to pass that. And I, and I think I didn't do enough of that at Stonewall and I think that was distracting. Um, but practically, we introduced a campaign in an era of Theresa May, Justine Greening, Ruth Davidson, Margot James, lesbians on in positions of power, and we attempted to instigate it in a time of Boris Johnson, um, Dominic Cummings, and you know Michael Gove. So we should have predicted that that would have happened much more quickly than than we thought it would. I think we thought we had about another two years of niceness before we got into that. Yeah. Thank you for being so open with us tonight, Ruth, um, and uh, and so trusting uh, of this space because you're sharing. Um, uh, some really important things I know that a lot of people in this school will benefit from hearing um, and that we will all be able to reflect on. Um, George says, I've seen other LGBTQ activists talk about the UK as especially transphobic, uh, more so uh, that the United States or Europe. Do you think that's the case? I mean, you, you, I think his question yeah. came in before you answered it. I think you partly answered it already. But I suppose I'd build on that. Well, what are you benchmarking it? Um, how do how do we know that? Well, it's not a science, um, but I think hate crimes are going up. So, so you've you've got good data that hate crime against trans people is going up, um, and and the fact that our legislation is not as advanced as other countries is is a good indicator. But I think it's the fact that quite um, small c conservative uh, Americans are shocked and appalled at some of the things that are being said in the mainstream press here, which isn't science, but it's quite a good indicator of, of where we're at. So the, 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 the tone of the debate has been incredibly um, aggressive. That, that, is, that is shocking. It's not British. It's, it's yeah. not a British way of doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, we will always have debates about sport, about prisons, about uh, refuges, about rape crisis centres, about um, when is someone able to self-identify, when we should believe people and when we shouldn't. America is just way beyond that. You know, America's like, you know, here is the complexities, this is how we've dealt with them. And when someone says they are who they are, we believe them. WTF Britain. <laughs> like, so, th so that's quite an odd position to be in, that we're the kind of slightly clumsy, poor relation in this. And that's not to deny that there's conversation to be had, but, but the way those conversations are being had are quite shocking, I think. That, that's what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, 
uh, a question from Stephanie. I think it's rooted in what philosophers would call utilitarianism. <laughs> it's fantastic. Thank you, Ruth. I'd like to hear more about whether you believe uh, that in the campaigning world, it's sometimes appropriate to prioritize one issue over another. And here we are, for example, if one group is experiencing more immediate harm. Yeah. With straight back to Jeremy Bentham, utilitarianism, what's the answer, to Ruth? That's why I love doing university talks. Um, yes, of course, because but, but basically what you're always doing is working out what resources you have, what can be deployed at any one time. But I think I think where the subtlety comes in is sometimes the, the most immediate route to that group is not the obvious one. So Stonewall ran a long and continues to run a long campaign on sport. We do lots with Premier League footballers and, and I used to do a lot with Premier League footballers. And with Premier League footballers, it was very much um, some people are gay. And if they can tell you they're gay, they might score more goals. Yeah, great. Um, you know, there was not a let's talk about the intersectionality and the way in which that, that you know, that was the priority of the campaign is to get them into a place where they accepted that sexuality was relevant to the conversation. Yeah. In turn, that means that Man United supports LGBT rights and they are one of our biggest exports to Africa. So Africa and supporting LGBT activists in Africa, they said to us, we need the big brands like Man United coming out for this. We wouldn't have opened with Man United on we need you to support us in Africa. So, yeah. so sometimes, it, and it, it takes a slightly, we, the, the, the effective campaigning is working out your kind of multiple score points with some of the most basic messaging and how, what, how multiple outcomes you can achieve from that. So if we'd said, look, what's more important, whether you can, a Premier League footballer can come out or not, or supporting an African LGBT activist, well, the answer would have been the African LGBT activists. That gay people are dying in Africa every single day. I mean, of course, but there are more ways than one way to skin a cat, which is my academic response. So, so you kind of, everything at Stonewall, we went through a theory of change. Um, and that theory of change was about to what extent is this intervention going to have multiple different outcomes on different communities that further things along. I think the risk is when you're doing those prioritizations, who do you damage and who you ignore? And I think that there were times when Stonewall said, we are now going to relentlessly pursue this LGB agenda uh, because there are more LGB people. We've got to get this through. This is the legislation. So I remember training um, every immigration judge in the country on uh, how to support, uh, how to recognize LGB asylum seekers, because their question was, have you done anything gay and did you enjoy it? And that's just simply not the right way of assessing whether someone's at risk of persecution because of their sexuality. Yeah. I didn't in those moments talk about trans and I could have done right. and it would have it would have done it would have done no harm. Um, and it was that kind of, well, what's the most, what's the most pressing priority here? We, we, we forgot the, the few in pursuit of the many. And I, and I think that that's, uh, that's problematic. Right. Thank you for that. Um, Ian, not the Ian I think we had previously, a different Ian. Ian asks, um, social media platforms align closely with generational perspectives. What is happening on the new social media are we too obsessed with Twitter? It's a good question. Yeah, I'm sure we are, Ian, and that's part of its that's part of the drug that comes with this, isn't it? I follow. Um, if you don't follow Ethics in Bricks on uh, Twitter, it's a it's a delightful Twitter account that that, that depicts some of this stuff in in uh, in Lego, which which I'm a big fan of. And I, I think that it, if not Twitter, it would be something else. Um, and I think Twitter is is the is the platform that is currently illustrating our tendency to um to to fall out with each other in a different way mm -hmm. generationally i think twitter twitter is is quite old i mean certainly none of the kids I, I do lots of school talks and none of them are on twitter but they are all on snapchat and they're sending each other abusive messages and and getting into all sorts of trouble so twitter twitter is is the thing of the moment um but it will be replaced because we're not working out how we can have discourse and disagreement in these new ways yes. you know yes that that's the thing that that um i was talking earlier to uh, christiana who's done a brilliant job of organizing this incidentally and 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 when lockdown hit a lot of the things i was going to do in rooms came on on this screen 
And one of the first ones I did, we were bombed by about 30 people who were just bombarding with very, very negative messages in a way that they would never do that in a town hall. You know, they just would it wouldn't, that's not the done thing. They might have asked a slightly passive aggressive shady question from the back, but but you wouldn't get 30 people going, Ruth, you're scum. So we've got to kind of work out how we talk to each other in this space, because when Twitter goes and Twitter will go, something else will, will rear in its place, probably five you know, it's Hydra, isn't it? So the more important thing is how well, do we work Ruth, out how to... Ruth, as my daughter asked me a few years ago, she said, Daddy, when you were younger, was the internet in black and white? Yes. And that was a real sensation. <laughs> that things indeed come and go. I love that. But yeah. <laughs> Did you make the modem noise? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. There's no good at drama. So it's not Twitter and it's not generational, but there is something about how we manage public discourse, I think. Yeah. There's um, a question, um, a powerful question from Libby. You mentioned the importance of forgiveness where people make mistakes, but do you think there's a threshold of behavior where asking this of the recipient is actually asking for a lot, where either organizations or groups of people repeat the same thing against a marginalized person over and over again, knowing it's harming them, but do it anyway. I struggle with situations stemming from what are arguably issues pertaining to inclusion escalate into bullying, harassment, stalking, violence, etc. The forgiveness requirement when this happens starts to feel like the victim. Absolutely. There's that yeah. amazing moment, Ruth, that, that this question reminds me of. It's why I think it's powerful. In that incredible film, The Imitation Game, um, and Alan Turing is supposedly a boy at Sherburne, and he was being bullied for being slightly different in inverted commas. His reflection in the film, part of the script, don't know if he ever said it in real life, but it's a powerful moment, is the voice says, they bully me because, because they enjoy it. People, humans enjoy almost the degradation and the terror that they can bring to others. And I find that uh, a, a frightening, frightening um, point and powerfully yeah. reflecting well in this question. And I, I think I think the, 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 your, your observations are absolutely spot on, Libby. I think I think it comes down to what do we mean by forgiveness, and and what do we do with that? I think is and and this this is probably uh, more personal to me in terms of of, of how I cope, maybe. And the, 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 for, forgive me for those of you who who think God is a social construct designed to control the masses. There's a really important line in um, the Lord's Prayer, which is, um, "Forgive those as we uh, forgive me." we ask God to forgive me and then I'm asked to forgive those who trespass against me and it's a very very difficult ask and it's very um, easily misinterpreted in the Lord's Prayer it's presumed that you're saying God forgive me and forgive those who are mean to me no the prayer is God forgive me and help me forgive those who are mean to me and I think about that line a lot um, even in in my days when I'm um, very eye raising about about um, an interventionist God, and my partner doesn't believe at all in any of that stuff. So so it's a common theme in our household. It's very very hard to forgive those who trespass against you. It's it's incredibly hard. So what do I do with that when I when I can't find it in my in my I can't find a way through it? It just goes in, and it turns into shame, and it turns into it, it turns into something that festers for me. So I've got to find a way of rationalizing what's going on now does that mean i excuse does that mean i uh say it's okay does that mean if there is no change in behavior i keep going it's all right not at all and and when i talk about that 25 percent that building bridges it's not with the enemy <laughs> you know you there, there are people who may stop being an enemy but but it's but it's not it, it's not about that um but i might try and really work very hard and sometimes it's really hard to understand what's going on there and and what the basis of that is and to be honest then there is a there is there is hope then of changing that and yeah. moving that enemy into into this camp um so so it's it's certainly not about um excusing or making it acceptable it's about me finding a way through um, on, on some of the darker times. And, and I think that the reason why that's that's important to me is because of the work I do with the Church of England. So a lot of my work, so I, I published a book uh, last year called Queer Prophets, which was curating um, lots of different LGBT Christians from across the globe. 20, all had a, 24 yeah. different writers. Yeah. 
yeah. they all, all had a slightly different take. You know, and some of them had had terrible stories. Some of them had fine stories. Some of them had amazing stories. You know, it was all about them going, this is, this is my relationship with God. And sometimes that's despite you, organized religion. Sometimes it's because of you. And that led to me having, uh, that's it. Thank that's you. Too. Right, um, all, all royalties so well. That led me um, doing a lot of work with different church faith leaders. And I had to um, find a way of trying to forgive where they were coming from in order to try and build build something with them. Because otherwise all they would face was my anger and my pain and hurt and disappointment. And that's for me and my therapist or for me and my God, it wasn't for that moment. And I kind of had to find a way. So so Libby, you're right to, to call me on it and, and you're right to challenge me on, on the blitheness in which I, I, I suggested it. But I also think it's a necessary part of us not um, just walking away all the time. I think I think it's it's too easy at the moment to walk away, and I think we have to keep at it. But that's where power comes in. So when you have someone, um, if I'm in a situation where someone is consistently and continually homophobic towards me, then I need Tim in that room instead of me. You know, because Tim in that situation has more power. He's got the chat. He knows the issues and. Tim has got has got less skin in the game. And that's why it's easier for me to stick up for trans people sometimes than expecting trans people to do that. It's easier and right for me to challenge racism. In the Lords, I've noticed you get you get um, seven minutes or five minutes to speak. and Everybody runs over. And, and when you run over, there's a kind of shift in the mood. You can feel it. They chibi black people along. There's a kind of real sense of come on. They never do that to white people. Now, I can raise that with the Lord Speaker. It's not down to the black peers to raise that with the Lord Speaker because I don't have skin in the game. Whereas if they go to the Lord Speaker and say, I think they were chivying me along there, he'd say, well, you were running over time. And of course, the, the unofficial culture is that we all run over time. So how do we deal with it? So, so in that moment, who does those things and those conversations becomes incredibly important. And I think people get too frightened. So people kind of go, well, I'm an ally, but I don't know what to do about racism. And I don't know if I can say anything about homophobia. And I don't think I can. And it's like, you can, and I will help you get there. And I will forgive you when you make mistakes on that learning, because I need you in the room doing that. And that, to me, I think is what it's all about. Brilliant. Uh, next question. Um, uh, from somebody without a name. They're called Meeting House. Um, Good name. It's great, isn't it? Do you see any distinction? Um, sorry. Yes. Do you see any distinction between building bridges and building alliances? Is building bridges important to reach those who do not wish to be our allies? Yes. Uh, um, yeah. So, so, so you're you're. It's a strategic move. Sometimes you're you're building bridges um, in order to build alliances, but your alliances continually need builders bridges building between them. It's 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 not at the moment. It's very easy to stick in your lane. I'm doing this. You're doing that. There's nothing in it. The bridge helps us find commonality, and and that does lead to alliances. Sometimes, um, sometimes they're very tenuously held. But but yes, it's it's the same principle. But building the bridges leads to the building of the alliances. Yeah. Anwar has a question that somewhat similar to the earlier one, so, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, Anwar says, when I think about why some people are unkind and without compassion towards EDI, most people wonder why they feel this way. I often wonder why it's simply easier for some to be cruel and inconsiderate. It feels really easy for negative commentators to be who they are. Do you think that being cruel and mean is simply an easier path for some to take? And would you agree that being kind and compassionate does genuinely take more care and attention for some people and that it's a harder path for some to take? Absolutely, Anwar. And I think I think that gets to the heart of, uh, you know, why do people hate and why do people hate themselves? And I'm sure there are people in Middlesex who have a lot to say on uh, inward shame, where it's come from, how it's built, and what all the things we do to maintain it and sustain it. I think one of the things that I find um, most challenging is when that cruelty and meanness comes from people who have experienced that kind of oppression themselves. That it, you know, the, the, the kind of assumption is that if if you belong to a minority background, we've already built the alliances, and, and we simply haven't. And I think that is a lot about shame and internalized shame. And and I think it's very easy to to try and find someone else who's in the rubbish position. And I think, Anwar, it's, it's the, the, 
the height of all of us, a uh, task to all of us to try and dismantle that and, and find a better way through it. Okay. Um, Ian, who has already asked two questions earlier, has made a statement. So I'm simply going to read out his statement and then I'm going to go on to the next person, Paul, with the question. So Ian simply, I think, says, we are responsible, and it's up to you, Ruth, if you want to come back on this at any point, completely up to you. But the statement is, we're responsible for most of the global legal homophobia because of the empire. Most of the negative laws globally are inherited from us. So that's that. And Paul says, I am a white heterosexual male, so realize that I sit very near, if not at the top of the pile, when it comes to privilege, power, and not being discriminated against. I really try to stand against abuses and discrimination when I see it in both the real and the virtual worlds. However, I sometimes struggle to always be able to see the position that some others are coming from. An example being the use of such a wide plethora, which seem to be so many as to be setting me up to fail, e.g. using him uh, he, him, she, her, they, them, etc. But when there are 50 plus gender pronouns, I get lost and feel out of my depth. Do you have any advice in how I can tackle this in myself and the world in which we circulate? Um, it's, it's, it's a good question, Paul. And, and I, think, I think what you're describing is, um, is, is something really important about how some of this, this work is, is, is developing and evolving. And I think that it's, we, we kind of get to a place of understanding and go, I think I've got it, I've got your back, don't make it any more complicated for me. And the reality is, is that people's lives are complicated and messy and teenagers and adolescents and students and adults have been exploring their identity for aeons and, you know, decades. David David Bowie, I imagine that when my dad saw David Bowie or my granddad saw David Bowie, it was like, well, hold on a minute, I can I can get this, but but no more. And part of um, the beauty of life is that we're being stretched beyond our limits. But with that comes um, a, a sense of pressure. How, how do you learn all this and how do you get it right? And I think part of that's what I mean about um, positive, active and kindness in that you you do what you can in that space and you make a commitment to thinking about learning and, and developing but it's also about recognizing that we are all learning all the time and that for some people exploring different ways of using their pronouns is an incredibly important stage in them thinking about what they're doing it's not really designed to catch you out um, or trip you up if your intentions are good then you'll get there. I mean, I've got lots of non-binary people in my life who use they, them pronouns, and I used to know them before they use they, them pronouns, and I make mistakes, and I slip up, and I correct myself quite quickly, or they correct me, and I apologise, and we move on. I think I think part of, if, if it's important that we don't think that it's, it's all about making things too hard for us. It's about someone just working out their life in their own way, and we can kind of just do our best to go along with that if our intentions are good. The yeah. problem is when there's cruelty in response to that. Yeah. Um, and they go, well, I, I think that's all nonsense and waste of time. And that's not how you come across, Paul. So I, I think what I want to assure you about is no one, I, I hope that no one's trying to catch you out. And if they are, that's the culture we need to change. But an, an apology disarms criticism has is, is always been a good maxim of mine. And we just all keep learning about each other and keep making mistakes. Absolutely brilliant. George um, has a question, but I think they're in two parts. So there are two questions, I think, technically. You were talking about Barclays having LGBT policies. How do you feel about banks and big business? Oh, I'm so over it. And banners at Pride. Um, that's a really good question. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm quite over it, George, to be honest. Um, so because I, I, I don't mind them doing it if they're doing a whole load of other stuff as well. It's when basically, what are you doing for LGBT inclusion? We spent 30 grand on a float and bought lots of straight people champagne so they had a party out, I'm a bit like whatever. Um, I think that Barclays does enough that if they want a party and they wanna spend a bit of money on a float, I'm cool with that. So I think it's what you do around it. Um, personally speaking, I don't think it's a good use of money and 20 grand that you spend on a float would make a huge difference to the local LGBT youth group in Middlesex. Um, you know, it would be transformative. So, so 
I've changed my mind on it, George, but also I'm a complete introvert. And um, I think lockdown has, has helped deepen and strengthen that for me. I don't drink, so I don't really enjoy pride, to be honest. So the kind of performative element of pride, I always find a little bit um, annoying and I'd rather they spend the money on other things. Again, thank you for being so direct, Ruth. Um, <laughs> not so much a question, but as you talk about etiquette online, it reminds me of the, the eternal September, the time after 1993 when the internet became accessible to people besides uni students. Before that point, the only time there was obvious use was in September when new students arrived at uni and had to learn the new rules of the internet di discourse. Post-1993, there were too many new people to, to teach community behaviours. Um, well, I think we've covered that, haven't we, earlier? Yeah. Um, I think a set of rules and code of conduct for people to sign up to wouldn't do any harm. Yeah. You know, this is this is what we expect. This is this is how you bring the university into disrepute. I, I, I don't think there's any harm in, in a bit more regulate. The Lords don't have any rules about what governs my behaviour on social media or outside the chamber. I find that fascinating. You know, the idea that I sometimes have a personal capacity that I could go on Twitter and say whatever I want is seems an anathema to me. But yeah, we're all we're all a bit slow to catch up, I think. Yeah. And then the last question is from Jonathan, um, who says a, a simpler question. As someone who has been there and done that, what leadership tips um, come in mind uh, for an LGBT staff network co-chair? More complex. Can you give any comments on academic freedom, thinking about academics with anti-trans views? Yeah. So this evening. There was someone else, I think it was called Diane. She did flash up a question. Whoever Diane maybe she said goodbye. She said she's okay. got to go. That was all. Um, so so Jonathan, thanks for your question. Um, in terms of the top tips, get a strategy, a business plan, a governance process, make sure it links with the wider um objectives of Middlesex University, rotate your chairs and ensure that chairs and officers are remunerated and rewarded for their time and it's carved out of their day job. I mean, professionalise, professionalise, professionalise um, and get a strategy in line. We're doing some really interesting work at Deeds and Words with the co-op where we're bringing all the network groups together to design a combined strategy with individual activity underneath, but a coherent strategic str like approach to the whole of the staff-based inclusion that basically challenges how leadership are doing it and make sure that staff and their experiences are at the root. Everything's got to up their game on the network groups, I think. Um, academic freedom, academic with anti-trans views. That's a really easy question to get under the line, Jonathan. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think it's not a new question. I think it's a question that has, that has plagued academic um, institutions for centuries. Uh, see Thomas More. Um, so there's a there's a kind of constant thing about this. I think the question has to be, and the only question has to be, are you in a position where you are capable of leading and teaching diverse students? And if you create an intimidating, hostile, or degrading atmosphere for those students, what do we do about that? Um, I think I think that cannot be presumed from someone's written work, but there is often good clues in someone's written work. I think the trans stuff gets too complicated for people, so you need to think about it in terms of racism. So if someone wrote a highly racist article, you would question whether they had the capacity and ability to teach black staff, and you'd know what to do in that situation. I think the problem is, is that the, the, those who are trying to make these decisions get muddled up with the trans issue. Um, but the question should be, is that person capable of creating an intimidating, not creating an intimidating, hostile and degrading atmosphere for their students? Um, C. Thomas Cromwell. Very good. I like that. Brilliant. Um, Ruth, I can't thank you enough. Um, I said to someone a little earlier, um, and I'm a fairly atheistic agnostic, um, but I said, it, from where Middlesex University is coming from, Having you with us, it is literally a little bit like being visited by God. Oh, we have, Tim. <laughs> we have huge high esteem. Um, can I start by just thanking Christiana Rose, who, as you know, Ruth, has done the most phenomenal job in supporting yeah. us to bring this together. Absolutely brilliant. And also, uh, dear and wonderful uh, colleagues, Kim Raymond, um, uh, Paul Stapleton, and, uh, and also Anna, Anna Kipriano, who I'm hoping is online this evening. Um, but who has empowered me uh, for some time to oversee, to manage uh, and, and to chair these DLSs. 
Ruth, that was fantastic. And I really um, thank you for it. Um, uh, over recent years, um, I think, and it's something I've uh, uh, worked hard at, I think as a university, we have created a lot of people that we would class as friends uh, in, particularly in the House of Lords. Um, and we, you and I were talking earlier about um, dear Claire Fox, who is, is not only a long-standing friend of mine, but as I joked with her uh, recently, she's probably my favorite former member, previous member of the Revolutionary Communist Party to be put as a crossbencher, of course, in the House of Lords. Uh, Lowly Young, who I think will be a crossbencher with you, talked some years ago at Middlesex and remains close. On the Tory benches, Sai Kamal, who's a very good friend and a former academic as well, um, uh, but a good friend of Middlesex. Freddie Howe, who as Minister for Defence and previously Minister, Tory Minister for Health, has actually been very, very supportive in all kinds of progressive issues. On the Labour side, Philip Hunt, uh, he has always been a really good friend and close to Middlesex University. And on the Lib Dem side, Susan Kramer, um, their economics spokesperson. These are all progressive characters, and I'm sure they'll all be delighted that, 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 that you've joined the chamber for what you represent across so many spaces. So it is without further ado that I thank all my colleagues for have, having supported me and brought this all together, and Ruth, um, what can I say? Please uh, keep in touch with us uh, when the world, when restaurants reopen, uh, we do run a series of uh, Westminster dinners at Middlesex University, but down in Westminster for opinion formers. And we'd love to have you um, perhaps as a speaker or as a guest uh, as you get into your stride, hopefully for many years to come down there. So thank you so much. It's been absolutely brilliant. And we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you all for, for coming. Really appreciate it. Have a good evening, everybody.